Well, my essay on uh, civil liberties and the Constitution is definitely about Lincoln in his time and uh, not much on ours. So I thought today that I would try to redress the balance a little. Um, and in the essay, I uh, analyze at length a chilling public letter on internal security and free speech uh, written by Abraham Lincoln in June 1863. It's come to be called, um, after the name of the man to whom he addressed it, the Corning Letter. Uh, it wasn't really a letter at all. Uh, it was a public statement distributed to the press, uh, reprinted in at least uh, seven different pamphlet versions in 1863. In fact, uh, just before I left for New York, I saw uh, uh, one published that was published in 1863 in San Francisco for sale on eBay. So in fact, there are eight different versions. Um, the, the, the opening bid is $150. Uh, if, um, if you read the Corning letter as I do, uh, you will see that it is possible to draw a straight line from Abraham Lincoln to John Ashcroft. On December 6, 2001, less than two months after the terrorist attacks on buildings in this city and elsewhere, Attorney General Ashcroft, in a statement to the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, said, quote, to those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists, for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemies. Now, what Lincoln said in the Corning letter back in 1863 was similar. Lincoln argued that when the Civil War began, the Confederates from the very start hoped, he said, quote, uh, to keep on foot amongst us a most efficient corps of spies, informers, suppliers, and aiders and abettors of their cause, unquote. These allies of the Confederates in the North would operate, he said, and I quote again, under cover of liberty of speech, liberty of the press, and habeas corpus, unquote. And all of this sedition, conducted under an umbrella of freedom of speech and under an umbrella of the argument that the president didn't have the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, all of this, Lincoln said, was, quote, part of the enemy's program, unquote. So, like Ashcroft after him, Lincoln characterized libertarian critics of the government and defenders of First Amendment freedoms and uh, uh, critics of the suspending the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, he characterized them as sympathizers with the nation's enemy in a war. Well, you might say, words are cheap. And if we're going to conduct a serious analysis and comparison of the internal security measures of the Lincoln administration and other war administrations in American history, we're going to have to look at something other than words. You've got to look at behavior. But here, too, Parallels can be drawn, even to some of the most controversial behavior. Were there foreshadowings of waterboarding under the Lincoln administration? Well, the answer, in a way, is yes. Among the arrests of civilians made by military authorities in the North during the war were people who were erroneously arrested as deserters from the army. Now, when you go out arresting uh, men uh, suspected of being desertion, well, some of them turn out not to be deserters and are, in fact, innocent civilians. So some of these civilians then, however, while they were arrested, were subjected to, well, what turned out to be a standard treatment the Army used by 1864 to, exact, um, to extract confessions from deserters. This treatment wasn't waterboarding, but it did involve water and painful consequences. And it was papered over by government language, uh, by, by a government euphemism. They were called shower baths. Now, the practice wouldn't likely have come to light had it not been the case that some of the innocent civilians turned out to be British subjects. Um, um, 
this sort of resembles the situation of Guantanamo detainees. Right? Uh, uh, there's more t interest in the ones who are, who are, are British uh, citizens. Well, the British subjects in the Civil War military prisons, uh, th these were recent immigrants uh, to the United States, principally from Ireland. Great Britain took a very dim view of abuse of its subjects by foreign governments. And Britain's official representatives in the United States looked after their subjects uh, who asked them for help. Now, when a British official encountered abuse um, and then demanded an explanation from the State Department, well, in those days, uh, they got an answer from the State Department because the United States' uh, uh, principal problem in foreign policy was to keep Great Britain out of the war. That was William H. Seward's uh, job. Uh, and so, uh, when Britain asked, he answered. One of the prisoners, a uh, British subject, was a man named Matthew Murphy. Uh, he was an Irishman who was in jail in Alexandria, Virginia in October 1864. He'd been arrested on suspicion of desertion because he was wearing some government issue clothing and because he was, according to the arresting officers, a hard looking man. Uh, Murphy complained that after his arrest, he had been handcuffed um, and suspended from the ceiling. Murphy, uh, uh, the federal authorities in Alexandria couldn't categorically deny that that had happened. Well, J.W. Nash uh, was another British subject and he's a more typical case. Like many of these suspects, uh, he had been arrested about to board a train at a station. He was in the company of two deserters he was dressed the same way they were, and he carried the same amount of money they did. So he was obviously suspected of being a bounty jumper. Uh, that is one of these persons who enlisted in order to receive the lucrative uh, cash bounties extended to volunteers late in the war, and they just pocketed the money and then deserted and, and maybe enlisted again and got more bounties. Well, when the British minister uh, to the United States, Lord Lyons, investigated Nash's case, he learned that Nash had been the victim of, quote, violent cold water shower baths, unquote. The captain of the Central Guard House in Washington, D.C. admitted that Nash had been, and this is a quote from his report, the captain's report, he had been subjected to what is called a shower bath, which consists of a stream of water from a small rubber hose. It is not severe, nor at this season of the year very unpleasant, as the prisoners here shower each other for their own comfort daily. Lord Lyons wasn't convinced. And he replied sternly, this explanation does not show that the cold water was applied in Nash's case in conformity with any law or regulations as a punishment for a known and proved offense. On the contrary, it tends to confirm the statement that it is used in the central guardhouse for the purpose of extorting by the infliction of bodily pain confessions from persons suspected of being deserters, unquote. Well, later that same summer, uh, the British protested the treatment of a prisoner subjected to, quote, a hose of water directed with full and powerful action against his naked person, unquote. This inquiry led to an admission that the judge advocate general of the army prescribed this treatment for certain kinds of prisoners. The army persisted in calling the practice punishment by shower baths, but the prisoners writing to Lord Lyons told another story. James Buckley, who was one of these uh, prisoners, maintained that he had been subjected to showering for two hours until his skin broke. How far up the administration did knowledge of this practice go? Well, of course, we know it went to the Secretary of State, William H. Seward. Um, he uh, dutifully um, uh, sent to Lord Lyons uh, explanations of uh, uh, the behavior of the prison keeping authorities, um, and he didn't attempt any cover up. On the other hand, he didn't apparently protest in behalf of the injured British civilians, and he didn't attempt to end the practice. My point here um, is not to argue uh, that Abraham Lincoln 
and John Ashcroft shared the same view of civil liberties in wartime. And I'm not trying to say that the central guardhouse in Washington in 1864 was a little Abu Ghraib. What I am suggesting is that it is very easy to find parallels in what are obviously different situations, the Civil War, or in this case, the War on Terror, or in other wars in American history. And so what I thought we needed for a long time is a system for evaluating uh, the programs of different administrations in American history on this subject. And so I thought I'd suggest uh, today uh, a, a, a system uh, to use to, uh, you can use it on the evidence that's in our Lincoln, okay? Uh, and the system uh, is uh, really, I just ask three simple questions. Uh, and you'll notice all of them are about behavior, not about law. Uh, the first question is, um, is the internal security system proportionate to the threat? Or is it out of all proportion to the threat? Second, is the system once in place used for other ends than the one of meeting the original threat? This test has several special considerations. Uh, we have to pay particular attention to the use of the system to prey on vulnerable portions of the society particularly those identified by the arresting authorities uh, by their ethnicity. Law professor Jeffrey Stone, for example, in a, in a book called Law and Liberty, says that, quote, almost always the individuals whose rights are sacrificed are not those who make the laws, but minorities, dissenters, and non-citizens. In those circumstances, we are making a decision to sacrifice their rights. Uh, we have also to ask as a part of this test whether the system is used to eliminate organized political opposition. In other words, to silence the opposing political party. Uh, and that was the principal question about the system that people in the 19th century asked. And then third, uh, the third question is, once the threat ceases, does the internal security system also cease? Uh, whatever we may think of the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, they did have, as, as uh, Professor Stone pointed out, a wise sunset provision. They expired before the inauguration of the next president, uh, which turned out to be a period of about two years. After I read uh, Stone's book, I noticed that Lincoln's proclamation specified that they, uh, these are proclamations suspending the writ of habeas corpus, uh, applied, quote, during the existing insurrection, unquote. But, we don't know what Lincoln would have done to end those measures uh, when the war ended because he was murdered right at the end. Uh, well, I also have to say, I, I can't help it, I'm a college professor, so I also, I, I also give these internal security s systems, I give them grades, all right, from F to A, the full range, all right? Uh, and I assign an F to anyone who becomes a dictator. Now, uh, that would be by not ending the internal security uh, threat uh, you know, system when the threat is over. Uh, so I know you know your American history, and no one has failed this test yet. Uh, and so I'm not assigning any Fs today. All right? But the full range of grades remains. So I'll begin with John Adams. I give him a D. Uh, he oversaw the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. He fails the provocations test. My, my test really, if you think of it, has three points. Provocation, victims, and termination, right? Okay, so Adams fails the uh, provocation test. There wasn't even a war. There was only a quasi-war with France. Uh, Professor Stone points out that some 316 American ships had been seized by the French, but the war was fought entirely on the seas, and obviously the arrest of newspaper editors in Baltimore and similar places hadn't much to do with security on the high seas. Um, Adams' administration also fails the victim's uh, uh, test. It was put uh, principally to other uses. The sedition part of the Adams internal security system was vigorously enforced. Under the Sedition Act, 25 people were arrested, 14 indicted, and 10 tried and convicted. Now that may not sound like a lot, but uh, they were all Jeffersonian Republican newspaper editors and, and writers and, and such. And uh, if you look at uh, what the uh, uh, Michael Schutzen, who's a, 
a, a historian of journalism, if you look at what he uh, says about the period, where there were about 200 newspapers in America at the time, perhaps 25% of these were uh, Republican, so there are about 50 Republican newspapers, and that means that the Adams administration took legal action against as much as half of the Republican press, and a quarter or a third of all the Republican editors and writers were indicted. That was a full-scale assault on the op opposition party, not on the French. Now, the Adams administration also flunks uh, the victim's test in another way, and that is because the Alien Acts uh, 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 targeted vulnerable immigrants uh, especially. Uh, the Adams administration then passes only the termination test. Um, so, to explain this, of course, the internal security measures of the Adams administration were were functions of basically 18th century uh, beliefs that there was no such thing as a loyal opposition and that political parties were just seditious. Uh, and that sort of helps explain the direction that that system took. Um, moving past Lincoln for a moment, I give Woodrow Wilson a C minus. Uh, he rates above Adams because, uh, in part, he doesn't altogether fail the provocations test. He did at least deal with a real war. It was a however, a decidedly foreign war, offering little threat to what we've come to call the homeland. Uh, the system under Wilson was aimed at least in part at sedition and espionage, not at the opposition political party. Um, it was more extensive in effect than the system under Adams. Uh, under the Espionage Act of 19, Acts of 1917 and 1918, the administration conducted 2,168 trials and brought uh, 1,055 convictions. Uh, like the Adams program, the Wilson program, uh, uh, however, was used for other ends, and it ultimately fails the victim's test. Among those convicted under these espionage acts were leaders of the industrial workers of the world. The administration also uh, uh, failed the victim's test in another way. Uh, that was by uh, arresting some 6,300 enemy aliens. Um, they met draft resistance by allowing the vigilante American Protective League to execute raids called slacker raids, uh, in which some 40,000 individuals were detained. Most of these uh, victims were immigrants and poor people. Uh, most writers on the Wilson administration acknowledged that the program was used to attack radical political movements, including especially the American Socialist Party. Uh, so uh, James Green says in Grassroots Socialism, quote, wartime repression and patriotic coercion killed the Socialist Party in the Southwest, unquote. That was his particular uh, subject, the Southwest. Um, it was also true, I think, that the atmosphere of repression uh, aided and abetted the Red Scare after the war. Uh, so the system can't be said precisely to have passed the termination test. It didn't exactly uh, end when the provocation uh, ended. Uh, and, uh, well, enough said. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I give him a D. Uh, his saving grace, of course, came on the question of provocation. World War II began with a Japanese attack on United States uh, territory. Uh, John Lewis Gaddis uh, makes an important point in his book, Surprise, Security, and the American Experience, he makes a very important point of reminding us that attack on the United States itself has been very rare, and surprise attack rarer yet. Uh, of attacks, you know, all that qualifies are the British invasion in 1812, uh, Pearl Harbor in 1941, and 9-11. Uh, but the provocation uh, offered uh, uh, by the people who were actually targeted by Ro Roosevelt's internal security system, uh, Japanese Americans, well, they really offered no provocation at all by way of sedition or sabotage. Uh, the provocation inside the United States had already been removed, again, as Jeffrey Stone shrewdly observes, before Roosevelt acted. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover had already arrested the persons suspected of being possible spies for Japan before the program was put in place. The Roosevelt administration fails the victim's test. The identification of the enemy in this instance was entirely racial by uh, their reckoning. Uh, it's notorious that Roosevelt did not put German Americans and Italian Americans uh, in concentration camps uh, as he did Japanese Americans. Um, Roosevelt does pass the finality test, uh, the termination test rather, uh, because he ordered an end uh, to the system uh, before the end of the war. I think we can say though, in balance to that appraisal, that the system had been planned before there was a war. 
uh, by the Navy Department in 1936. Uh, and as a result of this plan and what happened in the war then, 120,000 persons were put in uh, relocation centers. Well, the big question uh, remains what grade to assign to Abraham Lincoln. Over the years, he's been assigned varying grades, including, and it may surprise you, an F. Uh, some of the people who gave him an F included, or were pretty famous people, including the great literary critic Edmund Wilson. Uh, less well known, I think, is the fact, uh, uncovered by the constitutional historian Herman Belt, that the generation of scholars who founded American political science about a century ago effectively also gave Lincoln an F. Um, and I, I, I don't like to be uh, uh, rude to my hosts, but this included two Columbia University professors, um, William A. Dunning and John Burgess. Well, modern history has come uh, to give Lincoln at least passing marks by making one simple observation. The crucial observation was made by the historian Harold Hyman in 1977, and he cut through some 70 years of muddled debate about dictatorship by saying simply, quote, the most remarkable fact about the 1864 election is that it occurred, unquote. So that ended, among serious historians, I think, the debate over Lincoln as a dictator. But that leaves the whole grading system above F. And uh, Lincoln passes the provocation test, of course, because the U.S. was attacked by the Confederacy. Um, I wrote a book uh, about the victim's test, and uh, I, I, I certainly gave him a passing grade there. Uh, now, my essay uh, on this subject in uh, our Lincoln is meant to raise Lincoln's grade uh, by, for the first time, in part that's what the essay is about, uh, by attempting to answer the question about whether the Civil War security system uh, would have ended with the end of the provocation, which Lincoln didn't quite live to, to see. Um, there's really been no way to evaluate that point because uh, Lincoln was murdered at the moment the provocation uh, ceased. But if we pay close attention to the politics state by state, as Abraham Lincoln himself did, we can see the president realizing that the system must be relaxed where it is no longer needed or Americans would run the risk of an unfree government. Uh, so here was the way uh, this came about. Um, Lincoln was, uh, and, uh, well, Lincoln was a, a, a very keen student of election statistics. Uh, he pored over the election returns in 1864, and uh, he was uh, astonished to find that the vote in the North, what we would call turnout, increased even though there was a war being fought and hundreds of thousands of young voters were in the army and navy in the field. Lincoln was transfixed by this astonishing discovery. Uh, he saw it as providential proof of the soundness of the Union, and it was so startling to him that he decided to plan his whole annual message to Congress, which he had to give in a month. He planned that message uh, around it, uh, around this analysis of voting statistics. Uh, and uh, he used it not to celebrate in some gloating fashion his recent victory, uh, but instead, first, uh, he showed that it was a victory for the Union as, quote, no candidate for any office whatever, high or low, has ventured to seek votes on the avowal that he was for giving up the Union, on the distinct issue of union or no union, the politicians have shown their instinctive knowledge that there is no diversity among the people. Unquote. Second, uh, Lincoln noted the surprising, quote, calmness and good order with which the millions of voters met and mingled at the polls, unquote. So he was able to say that democracy calmly de deliberated the, the future of the government, even in the midst of this great civil war. And third, then, uh, Lincoln devoted the longest part of this section of the annual message to an analysis of election returns, using the statistics to show this astonishing turnout, which in turn proved that despite losses in the war, uh, as he said, quote, the national resources are unexhausted 
and inexhaustible, unquote. Now, he'd been carefully gathering these statistics uh, for the message. In fact, on December 1st, less than a week before he gave the message, he sent nine telegrams to nine different uh, governors of the northern states uh, requesting, quote, the exact aggregate vote of your state cast at the last election, unquote. Uh, and he was insistent, saying, quote, my object fails if I do not receive it before Congress meets, unquote. Uh, well, then he quickly tabulated these results and wrote in his message his glowing proof that, quote, we have more men now than we had when the war began, unquote. Uh, he was not transfixed, as some modern historians have been, uh, by the uh, losses in the war. He admitted it was, quote, melancholy to reflect that the war has filled so many graves and carried mourning to so many hearts, unquote, but it also came as, quote, some relief to know that compared with the surviving, the fallen have been so few." Quote. Lincoln said nothing about the other obvious conclusion to be derived from the statistics that he had compiled. There was an astonishing suppression of the turnout in Missouri. Voting in Missouri fell by 37 percent. Since the Democrats generally accounted for some 44 percent of the national vote, this stunning fall off in voting amounted virtually to the disappearance of the Democratic Party from Missouri. Lincoln could see in cold, hard statistics documenting voting behavior that Republicans in Missouri had obviously used his internal security measures, uh, the martial law that had been in place since John C. Fremont was a command there in 1861, to um, eliminate the loyal opposition. The figures, um, these particular figures about the suppression of the vote were included in a tabular appendix. Uh, he didn't dwell on them, uh, and the initial text just gave the uh, aggregate, but he noticed them. And Lincoln, though he didn't say a word about them, took dramatic action. Missouri, up to 1865, was governed by an illegal government put in Jefferson City by a coup d'etat in 1861. But in 1864, there was a gubernatorial election, so um, at the same time Lincoln was elected, then Missouri also chose a new governor by popular vote. Uh, so as soon as this new governor was inaugurated, Lincoln wrote him a long letter suggesting that he put an end to martial law. The governor, a man named Thomas Fletcher, was a beneficiary of martial law and declined. Uh, so uh, Lincoln decided he must circumvent the civil authorities. He created a new military district with headquarters in St. Louis, and he sent out a general, John Pope, explicitly to end martial law in the state. Lincoln was moving decisively to terminate the internal security system when the provocation ended. He passed the provocation test, he passed the victim's test, and uh, he passed the termination test. Now, I'm a notoriously tough grader, as the undergraduates at Penn State will attest, uh, and I'll give Lincoln today a B plus.